My task this evening is to introduce our speaker, Reverend Tr Tracy Blackman. Reverend Blackman is the Executive Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ and Senior Pastor of Christ the King United Church of Christ in Florissant, Missouri. Initially ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Reverend Blackman served in various ministry capacities for nine years prior to becoming ordained in the United Church of Christ and installed as the first woman pastor in the 18th as the first woman and 18th pastor in the 162 year history of Christ the King United Church of Christ. Can we give her a round of applause for that? <laughs> a registered nurse with more than 25 years of healthcare experience, Reverend Blackman's clinical focus was on cardiac care and in later years her focus shifted to mobile health care in underserved communities with the greatest health disparities in her region. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from Birmingham Southern College and a Master of Divinity degree from Eden Theological Seminary. As pastor, Reverend Blackman leads, church, leads Christ the King in an expanded understanding of church as a sacred launching pad of community engagement and change. This ethos has led to a tripling of both membership and worship attendance over the last several years, expanding membership and engagement opportunities and the establishment of community outreach programs. Regionally, Reverend Blackman's signature initiatives have included Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, a mobile faith-based outreach program she designed to impact health outcomes for impoverished areas, Sacred Conversations on Solomon's Porch, Quarterly clergy in-services designed to equip local clergy to assess physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health concerns within congregational life. And SISTA SOS Summit, an intergenerational health symposium for women and girls. And Souls to the Poles, an ecumenical multi-faith collaborative that was successful in providing over 2,800 additional ride to, rides to the polls during lo local and national elections. Reverend Blackman's communal leadership and work in the aftermath of the killing of Michael Brown Jr. in Ferguson, Missouri, has gained her both national and international recognition and audiences from the White House to the Carter Center to the Vatican. She was appointed to the Ferguson Commission by Governor Jay Nixon and to the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships for the White House by President Barack Obama. Reverend Blackman co-authored the White Privilege Curriculum for the United Church of Christ and toured the nation with Reverend Dr. William Barber of Moral Mondays. Reverend Blackman has received several awards and recognitions, and I'm just going to name a few of them. The White House President's Volunteer Service Award, the St. Louis, Missouri American Stellar Award, 2015 Ebony Magazine Power 100, St. Louis University Community Leader of the Year, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists Drum Major Award, and the NAACP Rosa Parks Award, just to name a few. So join me, please, in welcoming Reverend Tracy Blackman to the stage. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> it is indeed my pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for that introduction. And I want to thank the board for having me here. I apologize for the gruffness of my voice. I got on a plane yesterday feeling very well and got off that plane very sick. <laughs> so I apologize for the gruffness. It's my honor to be here with all of you this evening. I've been looking forward to our time together, looking forward to reflecting together on the immediacy of our times, looking forward to engaging you in one vantage point of the racial dis-ease of our nation, the vantage point of one black woman who preaches in America. 
I'm also honored to be in this space with one of my first seminary professors, Reverend Dr. Michael Kinman. And I don't know where he's sitting, but I'm nervous. <laughs> Dr. Kinman was one of the first classes I took at Eden Theological Seminary, and I often quote, so it's ironic that he's here, when people ask me, how do you do what you do? And I say that I had a seminary professor who told me on the very first day of class that if I could remember this one thing, that everything would be okay. God is God, and you are not. <laughs> And I've continued to remember that. It has taken me through many a day. So I'm grateful to you, Dr. Kinman. Also grateful to Dr. Kinman, for he was the one who saw an inquisitive seminary student who was long past the age of going straight from college. It was a second career. And gave me an opportunity by introducing me to the National Council of Churches. You probably don't even remember that but you allowed me to travel with you for a gathering in St. Louis for the National Council of Churches, where I, where I found out not only was God God and I was not, but that God was bigger than I could ever imagine, and that the interpretations of God were much more vast than had previously been a part of my world, and that too has carried me far. Thank you, thank you. I did not know when Professor Herbst invited me that I would be coming to you from Montgomery, Alabama, having attended a soft opening for the Equal Justice Initiative's National Memorial for Peace and Justice, dedicated to the 4,000 plus known black people who were lynched in the South post Reconstruction. I didn't know that I would be coming from a legacy museum that has been built in Montgomery, Alabama by Brian Stevenson and EJI, Equal Justice Initiative, called the Legacy Museum, which is a retelling of American history from enslavement to mass incarceration. I had no idea I would spend three days in a hotel in Montgomery, Alabama, overlooking Commerce Street, a major thoroughfare for the import of enslaved black people who were forcibly migrated from upper southern states to lower southern states to meet the increased demand for free labor following the banning of the transatlantic slave trade in 1808. I didn't know that I would visit this new museum built to fill in a part of American history that remains largely untold. By the start of the Civil War in 1861, Montgomery had more slave depots than churches or schools. And yet rarely do we tell the history of over one million enslaved black people ripped not from the African continent, but ripped from other states in these United States and forcibly shipped down south, making a mockery out of their families, separating parents from their children solely so that we could have economic gain. Brian Stevenson states, you can't understand civil rights or the Civil War without an appreciation of slavery and what the slave trade did, not only to Montgomery, but definitely to Montgomery. Which is why I wanted to begin this evening with memory. Memory is what shapes our context. I was quite aware this week that even though I am a native of Birmingham, Alabama, I was not seeped in the retold memories of my native state. I was not intimately aware of the legacy of human torture. I, like so many others, even though I lived in the state, born in 1963, I was quite familiar with the transatlantic slave movement, quite familiar with the civil rights movement, 
but not quite as aware of the domestic trade movement that happened in the United States. Memories that are painful for many. As I watched this memorial in Montgomery just this week, a part of which has columns for every county in the South where people have been identified as being lynched, columns with their names engraved and the date of their lynching as I watched over 4,000 names be suspended in the air on these columns, I was filled with tears as I watched a man named Reverend Charlie Cooper, who is now in his 90s, be wheeled to the column for Shelby County, Alabama, where his brother's name was the last name engraved. I became aware of how important it is to have accurate memory and how dangerous it is when we do not. This memory of a time when black bodies were not valued in the same way as white bodies in these United States. I certainly don't mean to suggest that only black bodies have suffered here, but I do mean to success, suggest that the perpetuation of a permanent underclass went to a new level with slavery targeting black bodies. I do mean to suggest that we, as people of faith, and I indeed was in Montgomery with a delegation of people of faith, I do mean to suggest that we cannot separate our understanding of who God is from what God's people have done. I do mean to suggest that much of what we are facing in our society, whether one ascribes to a particular faith dimension or not, is theologically based, is based in a narrative of forgotten memory, is based in a narrative that dissects what happened to indigenous people in this country from the doctrine of discovery that said amen to it, is based in a selective memory that would somehow perpetuate a God who would allow some people to receive favor at the expense of others. Religion and racism, my friends, go hand in hand. As I was watching the reactions of people in this museum in Montgomery, as I was experiencing fully what was burning in my soul from being in this place that was being reclaimed as holy ground, it did not escape me that Monday, this past Monday, was Confederate Monument Day in Alabama. <laughs> as I stood, in the shadow of this new museum, very conscious of the fight that we have going on about the preservation of monuments. I connect that also to memory. I connect it also to my sacred text, Christian text, which in Joshua 4 tells the story of the Israelites entering into a promised land, crossing over the Jordan, and Joshua taking a command to take stones from the bed of the river and put them on the shore and build a monument so that we might tell our children how God has brought us over. Monuments play a big part in our lives. As you can see, I don't know how many of you were able to watch the Katie Couric special. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I had the opportunity to share in 
a documentary that Katie Couric is doing, not just on race, but also on gender, also on Islamophobia, also on technology. But the first episode was on race and racism and the fight to preserve Confederate monuments. It's interesting how most of the arguments about these monuments are based on faulty memory and are based on a passion to preserve history. I find it pleasingly ironic that Brian Stevenson in this new memorial to lynch bodies with these suspended beams with the names on them has also created duplicate beams with all of those names on them that are lying on the ground around the monument. I originally thought there must be too many names to all be included in the memorial. Why would you have all of these beams laying in the grass lined up around this striking memorial? I talked with Brian Stevenson who said to me that he had had a duplicate made of every beam that the ones laying on the ground were the same as the ones that were suspended in the memorial and that it is his hope and the hope of EJI that as people come to this new memorial site in Montgomery that they will locate their counties, their southern counties and look at the beam that has the names of black people who were lynched there and then go back to their counties and petition the government for places to place a monument to the history of lynching on their land. He is so committed to this that if the counties agree to place the monument, EJI will bear all expense for transferring and erecting the monument in these southern counties where so many lives were lost. I am wondering in my whimsical kind of way whether or not there will be crusades and marches and events to support these monuments in the same way we see the resistance to the removal of Confederate monuments. I'm wondering, is it really about history? Is it really about monuments? Is it really about telling the truth? We shall soon see whether counties will accept or not accept these monuments. Monuments have a place in history. And some of you may know that I was in Charlottesville, Virginia last year I was preaching on a Friday night in the church that was holding the gathering of those who would stand in resistance to the white nationalist march that was planned for the next day. On that Friday night, there was no march planned. There was no resistance planned. We were simply gathering in that space to pray and to worship and to prepare ourselves for what we might face on Saturday morning. On that Friday night, it was an interfaith service where not just Christian preachers were participating, but rabbis and imams and everyone who wanted to have something to say about what was happening in Charlottesville, Virginia. We were coming together to prepare ourselves for Saturday. I had the easy job. I just had to preach on Friday night a word of hope and a word of peace and a word of abiding love. The hard work was on Cornell West for Saturday morning who had to preach people into the streets. But there was a surprise on Friday night. On Friday night as we neared the end of that service, we were told we could not leave the building. You don't tell a sassy woman from Birmingham, Alabama, she can't leave the building. <laughs> what do you mean I can't leave the building, I said. They said, it's too dangerous. There are 
white nationalists outside and we cannot allow you to go out the front door of this building. You can't leave at all right now. And when you do leave, we will have to usher you out of the back door or out of the side door. To which I responded, I am 55 years old. I stopped going out of back doors a long time ago. <laughs> Don't clap too soon. I did go out of that back door. <laughs> It sounded good when I said it. <laughs> they said, Reverend Blackman, we can't allow you to go out this door. I said, no, I'm going out the front door, me and Cornell West. And then I opened the door. And as far as I could see, I saw flaming torches of hundreds and hundreds of people. And I decided that the back door was not a bad option. But what I want to tell you about that night was that something changed in me. Because as a child of Birmingham, Alabama, I knew before I came that the Klan was going to be present. I wasn't afraid of the Klan. You can't grow up in Birmingham, Alabama and not know the Klan, not in my generation. I can remember at five years old standing on the side of the street and watching the Klan rally go by downtown. I did not have a sense of what it meant, actually. And I don't remember having any fear because I was standing with people who did not allow fear to surround me. I was curious about it and only remember because even at five, people look silly with pointed hats and sheets on. <laughs> That's what I remembered. And the flags and the crosses, I remembered that. And that's the image I had in my head when I was asked to come to Charlottesville, Virginia and stand with protesters there. But what I saw was not what was in Birmingham, Alabama. What I saw was a new level of hatred. The sheets were gone. The hoods were off. And you might say that that is better, and indeed, in many ways it is, but it was a shock because in that moment I realized that those sheets and those hoods had not only protected the anonymity of those who were protesting against my humanity, they had also protected me. For as long as I could make white supremacy a caricature, I did not have to deal with the fact that perhaps some of the people who hated me for being black were people that I worship with, people that I work with, people that my children attend school with. It was a new level of reality for me. And as I listened to them chant, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, whose streets, our streets, a chant from Ferguson, as I watched the faces of people who could have been my sons, with so much hatred in their eyes, I realized that faulty memory had finally caught up with us. You see, they were railing over something that is not really real. Race is not a real thing. Race is not biological. There is no anthropological grounding for race. Race is not mentioned in scripture at any point. Race is a societal construct created solely for the purpose of an economically advanced class of white people. Racism is real. <laughs> the feelings and, the, and the, the memories and the 
systems and the systemic ways that we have perpetuated oppression against others is very real, but it's built on a false narrative. And these young white men, some of them really believing that way and others just caught up in groupthink. Do you know what groupthink is? Others just caught up in the moment were operating under a false narrative that has not been true for a very long time, but that has been perpetuated in these United States. That white people are the majority and are under attack is a lie. White people have not been the global majority in a very long time, if ever. And the reality is this world is getting more brown. And we must figure out how to live together. I look at that, the memories and the monuments, and then I think about this year, with it being the 50th anniversary year of the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, the 50th anniversary year of the Memphis sanitation boycott, the 50th anniversary year of the release of the Kerner Report. A new report has been released, by the way, by the Eisenhower Foundation that says 50 years later, 50 years after Kerner, 50 years after the Watts riots, 50 years after all of the racial unrest, that we are in no better shape than we were 50 years ago. In fact, in some ways, we are in worse shape. And I watched and participated somewhat in some of the commemorations of the 50 years of Dr. Martin Luther King, a man that we have taken from being human to superheroic, a man that we have encased in granite, a man who we like to quote from seeing the world on a mountaintop. And I think about these mountaintops, mountaintops that church people like mountaintops. <laughs> it was on a mountain that Noah received a covenant from God that he wouldn't destroy the world anymore. It was on a mountain in the region of Moriah that Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac. It's on a mountain in Horeb that Elijah hides in a cave and stays there until he hears a still small voice that he identifies as God. It's on a mountain that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. And Peter says, hey, it's so cool up here, let's just hang out here and leave everyone alone. It's on a mountaintop that we place Dr. King's vision of what this world might be. And all of that is important, my friends, all of those visions and all of those revelations from the mountaintop are important, but the reality is all of those people, including Dr. King, had to come off of that mountaintop to get some work done. And the same is true of us today. The work is still in the valley. Which brings me to my story, a story of movements. I'm often asked, how did you begin speaking out against racial justice? How did you gain this platform that you now have? And the answer is, I didn't start with trying to get a platform. I started with trying to make a difference in the community I was serving. I became the pastor of a church that was in a neighborhood that was changing drastically. Pastor of a church where movie theaters and bowling alleys and activities for children had been replaced with check cashing places and payday loans and fast food had replaced restaurants and there was nothing for the children to do but to hang out on the corner. I was pastoring a church in a neighborhood where everyone used to own their home and now everyone was renting homes and now the children in the school next door were 85% free and reduced lunch. I was pastoring in a neighborhood where guns, real guns, were now just as prolific as toy play guns. I was pastoring in a neighborhood that was in trouble. 
in a dwindling con congregation that has seemed to lose its way. A congregation that drove in for worship and then drove back out to the suburbs where life was better to live. A congregation that had stopped noticing that everyone was not all right. And so a year before Michael Brown died, as a result of having done a survey of the community with my congregants, a survey that resulted in us opening our doors and declaring that we would not just be the church of those inside, but that we would be the church of the community. A move that saw us bring in different kinds of organizations, different kinds of services, offering free space as long as they connected to our community. My part in that was that I decided we would open our church to do funerals. I know that sounds morbid, but we were having a lot of funerals. And I don't know about California, but in the Midwest, if you are not a member of a church, churches are not always that happy about letting you do your funerals there. So we decided we would be different, that you didn't have to be a member of the church, you didn't have to have me as a pastor, that when Pookie and Nunu were killed on the street corner, if their grandmother or their mother or their father wanted a church funeral that you could have it at Christ the King, free of charge, you could do that there. And if there was no pastor, I would be that pastor. So in 2013, not 2014 when Michael Brown died, in 2013, a 21-year-old black woman was killed in a drive-by. The bullet was intended for her fiance, but it hit her in the head and she died instantly. She was holding a nine-month-old baby. Her grandmother called and said, I heard you said that people can have funerals there. I need a place to bury my child. I said, absolutely. And as I do with all families, I met with her and suddenly I knew that not only did they need a place, they needed a pastor, and I became that for them in that moment, and I ended up doing the funeral. I didn't always do them, but I did this one. The church was filled to capacity, over 500 people in attendance, and most of them young people. Unbeknownst to me, there was a young woman in that congregation by the name of Sierra Irby. Sierra had not donned the door of a church since she was 14. She was 24 at the time. She had sworn off church, she and her mother, because she was sexually violated in a church at the age of 14. Promised she would never return. But she came back only because it was her, her best friend that was in the casket. I did the funeral. Sierra never said anything to me. I didn't know that she was there. I didn't know that when she left, she had asked one of the greeters at the door for my business card, a business card for church that has my cell phone number on it. I never heard from Sierra again. I don't think she ever visited us. I certainly don't know that she did. Until August 9, 2014, when Michael Brown was killed. When Michael Brown was killed, I received a phone call from Sierra. And she told me the story that I just told you. That's the only way that I know. But she lived in Canfield Green Apartments where Michael Brown was killed. She had been out to breakfast that morning with her two young children, came back and could not get back into the complex because police were everywhere and the crowds had started to gather. She parked her car on the outside, walked into the apartment complex, and walked up on the dead body of Michael Brown. Her son, Jordan, who was seven, knew Michael, for Michael lived in the neighborhood. And he began to cry and ask who hurt Mike Mike. Sierra, not having any answers, went into her house, found the business card that she had put away with my name on it, called me and told me the story that I just told you. 
And she said, you didn't know it, but since that day, you have been my pastor. I need my pastor to show up with me in Canfield. And so this journey began. It did not begin in an institution, even though an institution was involved. It began because I was committed to seeing the humanity of other people, and the people I serve were committed to seeing the humanity of other people. There is no disconnect between the faith that we profess, the faith that we live, and the faith that we must take to the streets. Whatever your faith may be, or if you have no faith, in an in a organized religion, you believe in something. And that something of good moral fiber requires that we do something when we see people hurting. From that day until this day, I have committed my life to the work of racial justice. Racial justice, not always in the streets, Everyone is not made to be on the front line of the streets. The good news is that there are front lines everywhere. And for me, that line is in the church. Because I submit to you that ultimately what this nation is facing is not a political problem, is not a social problem. It is a theological problem. It is a theological problem that goes, yes, to race, but further than race. It is a theological problem that would have us believe that racism is the nation's original sin. But the real original sin of this country is the desire to be God, the desire to decide who is worthy and who is not, who deserves to be cared for and who does not, who deserves what they get and who does not. And from this desire comes all of the isms, not just racism, but sexism, heterosexism, classism, xenophobia, the belief that we have the right to decide who God will favor and who God won't, that we somehow deserve something that another part of humanity does not. It is a theological problem. And I am committed to doing all I can to deconstructing a theology of chosenness that has sent our world into turmoil. A theology that would suggest that God could somehow be divided against God's self. A theology that would suggest that we serve a God of favoritism and not a God of favor. A theology in the Christian perspective that would suggest that the Bible is God's book about a holy people instead of a people's book about a holy God. And when we understand the difference, then we began to have space for those who are other, those who are not like us, those who are equally blessed by God, those who deserve every right and every freedom, and every care, and every opportunity that this nation has to offer. It begins with memory, telling the truth about who we are. It begins with monuments, reminding us so that we tell our children the truth. Yes, it includes mountaintops for revelation to do work in the valley. And then it's time for movements. Movements 
like the one in Ferguson, movements like the one in Standing Rock, movements like the Me Too movement, movements like the Women's March, movements like the movement against gun violence. It begins with movements, for that's what faith is at its core. It's not our buildings, it's not our churches, it's people moving together for justice. Thank you. I think we're going to talk, right? This isn't exactly a question because you answered it right after I thought it, but I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about it. Um, I very much agree with you about um, the need to get over the idea of chosenness. There's a fairly uh, substantive theme of chosenness in our scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you said about the Bible being a people's book about a holy God kind of addresses how you get around that. But could you just say a little bit more about how you help people not, uh, help people let go of that need to kind of hold on to the chosen people thing and move beyond that? You know, it's, it's kind of ironic because I, I came to that, uh, one of my best friends is a rabbi, Rabbi Susan Talby. Um, and when we were on the, in the streets of Ferguson, as clergy people often do, we talk in scripture. Right? And so I would be telling a story about something that was happening and relating it to a scripture, and she'd be nodding until I get to the end, and she'd say, that's not how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> or she would be telling a story, and then she'd get to the end and say, and I would say, wait a minute, that's not how that goes. And so we began studying text together. Um, st I studied Torah with her. She tricked me into letting her go first. And so we're still in Exodus three years later. <laughs> but eventually I'll get my turn. Um, and when, when I began to understand um, that, so the, the challenge with um, challenging chosenness is that you don't want people to presume you're anti-Semitic. Um, and I'm not anti-Semitic. I am not suggesting that Jews are not chosen. I'm simply suggesting that we're all chosen. <laughs> and there's a difference there, right? Um, when I began to understand that the text that I had been taught as a sacred text, and it is sacred, because it describes the relationship of a God with people, because it can be used by anyone to see how God moves with people. It is a holy text, but it's also a history text for Jewish people. It's not a, a linear history, I'm not suggesting that, but it's a real story, right? It's a real story. And they captured the story in a way that it can be used by everyone. I don't know many Jewish people that consider themselves in the framework that Christians have used in terms of chosenness. And let's be honest, we don't leave it just in Jewishness, but in America, white people are the chosen ones. So we have to deconstruct this notion that God would somehow be divided against God's self. And the irony for those of us who are clergy is that in our seminaries, we spend the initial part of seminary deconstructing those notions. I remember having the rug pulled out from under me when all of my Sunday school lessons went out the window in seminary. And you survive it, and you get to the second year of seminary, and the third year of seminary, and you begin to put together a faith that you can actually defend and stand on, right? But then when we come out, we don't do that in our congregations. We teach the same stories that we learned. I mean, it's funny, but it's true, right? We don't trust our congregations 
to be able to understand that there is a difference. And so some of the ways that I do that is by challenging that curriculum, by saying when I preach, this is a people's book about a holy God. Thanks be to God that we have it. But we have to have those conversations. Something that was fascinating about Montgomery to me was that there are a lot of holograms in this museum with the actual narratives of people who were enslaved being depicted in holograms, right? And all of them had themes of faith. People who were living literally hell <laughs> were talking about their faith and holding on, their faith and believing because they needed that faith. And I think about the same scripture that they're referencing to hold on to is the same scripture that was used to oppress them, right? And so at some point we have to have those conversations. God can handle it, really. God can handle our questions. God can handle our interrogations. Don't hear me as saying I don't believe in sacred texts. I do. I do. But I believe that they are meant to show us the God in us. And we don't get there by having one group of people, whether, whether that's Jewish people, whether it's white people, whether it's rich people, God must be a God of all. Thank you. Reverend Blackman, thank you so much for that. Uh, boy, your congregation must just enjoy every Sunday when they get to hear you yeah. speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder if you could say something about your experience in healthcare and, and how that has informed your ministry or how, like what, uh, just the relationship between the two. Yes. Um, so nursing is my first ministry, right? I mean, it's, it's still healing. Um, is still making a difference in people's lives. Um, I don't know how I ended up preaching. I know how I ended up in nursing. Um, and I still, I, I, don't, I don't separate the two. I don't actively practice nursing anymore. Um, but what I ended up doing in the hospital, uh, I was on a floor, I was a charge nurse on a cardiac floor until I had my first baby. And then I had to work her first Christmas. And I made a promise that I would not work another Christmas ever in my life. That's funny, because now I work every Christmas. Uh, but I left the hospital setting because of that and went into insurance and then pharmaceuticals and ended back up in the hospital doing a program uh, where we uh, combined with the Urban League in St. Louis to have vans that we equipped for nursing and health care. And the reason was because we had such disparities in health care. We had a growing homeless population. We had lots of veterans who didn't trust the veteran facilities and weren't getting treatment. We had an administration that had put mentally ill people out of mental health institutions and onto the streets. I'm sure you're familiar with some of that. Uh, and our neighborhoods were suffering because of it. So we designed this program of mobile health units that would go to churches, because churches were still anchor institutions in these neighborhoods. We would go to churches, not on Sunday mornings, but during the week when they were having uh, you know, food pantries or clothing pantries or hot lunches for people. And we would park the van outside the same day of the month, every month, at different places. We became a floating clinic. We hired nurses that looked like the people that we were serving to help increase their comfort level. We began to know our clients just like you would know them if they were patients. And we had agreements with the hospitals um, and pharmaceutical companies that we could get drugs and get um, people into hospitals if we needed to do that. And we became the source for them of a stability in their lives. We also did cooking classes and all kinds of things on the vans. Um, and I began to see things that I didn't see, quite frankly, from my middle class life. 
right? Uh, being out in the streets every day, I began to be more in touch with the, the complexities of life that is not easy for everyone, that is not just about getting a job, that some people had two or three jobs and still couldn't afford a place to live, that it wasn't just about people who didn't want to do better, but sometimes it was about people who couldn't do better. And I carried that everywhere. Uh, the reason that I continue to pastor a church now, even with my schedule, is because I believe that ministry is proximal and that I cannot advocate on behalf of those who need justice unless I stay in close connection with those I'm fighting for. So they're still connected for me. Okay. As the uh, professor you referred to. I know. <laughs> I was going to pick this question over here, Dr. Kidman. Go ahead. Well, before a question, what I want to say is I wish for everyone in this room um, the joy that I feel in seeing a former student give such extraordinary leadership. <laughs> I also have a, a, a very brief um, story that I'd like you to respond to about memory, because yes. the memory theme that you ran through I thought was very powerful. I have a daughter you've met, my daughter mm -hmm. Leah, who's African American. She mm -hmm. still lives in St. Louis. You are a hero of hers. Mm -hmm. um, when Leah was three years old, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu came to a disciples' assembly and was there. And since that time, I have heard Leah say several times over, I met Bishop Tutu when I was a kid. I know, as her father, she didn't, because I put her in daycare that day. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's not an accurate memory, but there's something true about it. Because what she's saying is, I'm a black woman who cares about racial justice, and I met Bishop Tutu when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I think all of us, as people of faith, remember narratives, whether true in some sense or not, that shape who we are. And part of what we do is tell those narratives in ways that help us remember the future properly. We remember the past promises of God for what will be. Yes. I'm interested in you reflecting even more on this idea of memory and how it serves us as we think about racial justice. Yes. That's a professor question for you. <laughs> I think that's a powerful story that you tell, um, Dr. Kenman, and probably one that I share and don't know that I share, right? Um, memory comes to us in many ways, I believe. Uh, some of our memories are things that have been, been implanted in us through our parents, through our family, through our friends, and maybe are not exactly our story, but they have become our story because they've been seeded in us that way. Much of the biblical narrative is that way. It's so funny when you have, um, I was telling you my, one of my best friends is a rabbi, and so often we'll get the synagogue and the church together and we'll do services together. And it's always funny uh, the first time that somebody new is there who is Jewish to see how they react to black people claiming the Exodus story, right? Uh, claiming it as though we're the ones who got put out of Egypt, right? Um, and it is not our story in that way, but it is our truth. And I think what Dr. Kinman is naming for us is an instance in his daughter's life where it's not her story, but it is her truth. She knows that she was in the proximity of one who lights the way for where she wanted to go. And we know that we're in the proximity of those who have lit the way for us. That's a positive use of memory. There also is a negative use of memory in this United States, where we refuse to look accurately at what has happened historically. And we fear that 
Because how do you make up for it? How do you move past it? What words can you say that will make it all right? And the answer to that is none. It's not about making it all right. It's about acknowledging that it's true, that it happened, that the people who are here right now did not make it happen, but that we have in somehow been impacted by that story. And without that story, everything else we make up is based on a false narrative. Without that story, everything we say about one another is based on a false narrative. So what do we do with this truth once we tell it? We acknowledge that we have all been wounded by it. Not just black people. All of us have been wounded by the history of these United States. And once we acknowledge that, then we create space for healing and forward movement. Dr. Kinman's daughter may have a false memory, but she has a truth. I met Desmond Tutu because I know the spirit of Desmond Tutu. This nation must have a truth. This is who we were, and this is who we will not ever be again. That's how I feel about it. Reverend Blackman. <laughs> Dr. Kinnaman gave you a tough question and uh, that asked us to reflect on the past and its connection to the present and the future, and then we have aspiring generations that would also like to ask you a question. So I think if we could ask one more question sure. uh, and draw on your wisdom. Our final question. It's a really hard act to follow with that <laughs> question. <laughs> You're up to it. <laughs> um, I'm currently a counselor in training at Northwestern University mm -hmm. for underserved communities and veterans in particular. Um, and since you touched on that a little bit, I was wondering if you had advice for us going out into this world that may seem new, but really it's made a round circle of chaos. Yes. Listen more than you talk. Seriously. Listen to people's stories. Don't try to edit them. Listen and be fully present to what people tell you they need. Don't judge them for that. Listen deeply. And after you have learned the stories, ask them how they want you to help them. Give them the power that this world often takes from them to be a part of making decisions in their lives. Everybody has a story. And everybody has a critique on that story. There are only a few that show up to listen. And listening is what people need. Bless you.